What is up, y'all? I had a little bit, a bit of an incident. I was muted. <laughs> but happy Wednesday, y'all. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you're doing well wherever you are joining us, whether you are watching here on Behance or you are over on YouTube. I hope that y'all are doing well. And if you are excited for today as much as I am, um, and if you're wondering how you can use the new features in Adobe Lightroom, well, today is your lucky day because we are joined by Lightroom product manager, Ben Ward. As he's going to take us through his editing workflow and answer any of your questions that you have about the new features in the app. So Ben, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you, Adara. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm really excited today. As always, y'all, the more interactive you are, the better that this experience is going to be. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, whether you are on YouTube or Behance. That way we can make sure that, you know, anything that Ben wants to show us as he's going through his workflow, if you have questions about that, we can get to it. And before we go ahead and get started, if you missed the Adobe Fonts show this morning, make sure that you check out the replay, replay on YouTube or Behance. Awesome. So Ben, can you go ahead and let us know what we are going to be doing today? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you for that intro. So um, I am going to be showing you today uh, all of the new features in Lightroom that we just released on Monday of this week. Uh, and I'm going to be doing that in the context of uh, working through my complete workflow on a, on a personal creative project here that we'll be taking a look at uh, in just a moment. Awesome. Um, and I want to I want to mention kind of a couple of things right up front. Uh, and one is, as you said uh, in your in your intro, um, I am a product manager on Lightroom. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, while I might not be quite as spectacular a photographer or artist as, as Adara or as uh, other <laughs> guests that maybe you are accustomed to seeing on this show, um, I know a lot about Lightroom, like a lot. I know a lot about Lightroom. Uh, and so I, uh, and Adara said this as well, but I would really encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Um, this, is, this is your opportunity to ask your Lightroom questions of somebody who has worked intimately on the team for years. Um, and if I feel like your question is, is going to be of general interest to everyone, I'll answer it right now. Um, and if it seems like something that might be more specifically of interest just to you, I would encourage you um, to reach out to me uh, via email after, after the show, and I'll answer your question then. Um, maybe uh, our chat moderators could share yes. my email address. Yes, um, if we can drop chat. his email address, that'll be perfect. And I'm really excited about this, Ben, because like I told you before we started, I am a Lightroom Classics girl. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so okay. I'm really That's okay. Excited don't don't feel bad about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'm really, really excited to see how I can utilize um, some of the features in the new Creative Cloud, Lightroom Creative Cloud and how I can potentially maybe use both still, but kind of start to navigate over. Absolutely. And that is actually a great segue to the other thing that I wanted to mention right up front here, which is that I'm going to be working in Lightroom today, <laughs> not Lightroom Classic. So um, if you are a Lightroom Classic customer, um, what you see here is going to look a little bit different uh, than what you're used to seeing. Um, much of what I am showing here today uh, will be applicable to both. Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Some of it will not be. Some of it will just be things that are here uh, in Lightroom. Excuse me. And uh, it, it can be a little bit tricky to, to um, talk about the differences between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic because Lightroom is not Lightroom Classic Lite, right? Mm -hmm. Neither of the applications are a superset or subset of the other. They both have features that the other doesn't have. Um, and so it can be a little tricky to talk about that. I actually have 
a, a full on little like three minute presentation complete with a slide deck and everything about the differences between Lightroom and Lightroom <laughs> Classic, um, which I would be happy uh, to, to um, kind of detour into for, for just a couple minutes if that's something that, uh, that our audience is interested in. Um, if you want to learn about that, put it in the chat um, and let me know and I'd be happy to do that. Um, so ask lots of questions. Yes. Um, we're we're going to have a great time. Uh, and you will see throughout the course of what I'm showing you today and also tomorrow uh, that um, one of the big differences between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic is that Lightroom is cloud connected and everything that I do in Lightroom syncs to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so everything that I'm doing here, I can also do on my phone. Um, much of it I can do in a web browser. Mm -hmm. And so you will see me throughout the course of, of the um, broadcast today, you'll see me uh, switch over to my phone and show things there as well. So should be pretty interesting. Oh, that's going to be exciting. I, that's one thing that I love. Once I learned that I could synchronize between my desktop and my iPad, I can go from editing at my computer to sitting on the couch watching Netflix and editing. <laughs> that was a game changer. So really excited to dive into that as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you, know, you and I were talking about this just before the broadcast started, but that really is kind of the killer feature of Lightroom. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's hard to convey the value of in a setting yeah. like this, in a demo or a class. It you really it's kind of a kind of a slow burn on that on that feature. You really need mm -hmm. to sort of experience it over time. But you know, the first time you've been out with a friend and said, oh man, I want to show you this photo from <laughs> five years ago. Oh wait, I have it in my pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is is it's amazing. So um so we'll we'll look at some of those uh, workflows between desktop and mobile uh, today okay. as well. Perfect, perfect. So I think that we are ready to get going. Make sure y'all, if, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. But Ben, if you want to go ahead and take us into the project that we'll be focusing on today. All right, I will do that. Um, and I am going to start here by just showing you a couple of pictures. And actually, maybe I can just go full screen on that. Um, and I that was F. I pressed F to go full screen. I feel like I need to like fill all this in. I'm a Lightroom product <laughs> manager, so I need to provide all the details. Um, and I'm I'm just going to arrow through this a little bit while I while I say a couple words about what I'm doing today. So I'm uh, very interested in drone photography. Um, I think drones are a wonderful photographic tool. I love being able to put uh, put a camera anywhere. It's not always about getting up high and above something. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a picture like this. Um, mm -hmm. You wouldn't know necessarily that this was taken with a drone, but there is no other way I could have done it, you know. Um, so uh, it really, uh, really a lot of neat opportunities that are enabled um, by drone photography. And it's something that I've been really interested in um, in the last few years. And yeah. I think that uh, really kind of exploring and diving into a particular tool or technique uh, can be a great way to sort of creatively jumpstart yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been doing a lot of this and I, uh, I kind of worked my way towards the idea of this larger um, personal creative project that I wanted to do um, and that you're going to be seeing the beginning of here with me today. Um, I live in Alameda, California. Alameda is an island. Uh, in San Francisco Bay, and about a quarter or so of the island um, is a decommissioned uh, military base, um, a, a naval air station, and uh, stopped uh, that that was stopped functioning, I think, in '97 or something like that. And so it's been gradually kind of redeveloped um, by the city of Alameda, and they're building housing, and there's businesses popping up down there. But there's also tons of just weird cool things and kind of decrepit crumbling infrastructure from when it was a military base and gigantic airplane hangars that have been refurbished into breweries and all, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's it's in my backyard, almost literally. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to do kind of a documentation of this area wow. uh, of Alameda, of my home. Um, and using using my drone photography. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been out there busily flying my drone around, getting lots of pictures. This is not what you're looking at right now, although this is another very much not military base part of Alameda. <laughs> um, and so I've got all that footage and all of those, um, this, because I captured video as well, all of the footage and all of those still photos. Um, and we're going to take a look at those today. And 
I need to get out of full screen. There we go. I think the um, one thing I can quickly say, looking at these pictures of your home, they look completely different from where I'm from. I'm calling from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's just dirt <laughs> and sand. So this is absolutely stunning to see all the different areas, the water, the greenery, the beach, um, just to see so much variety in your hometown. I, I just wanted to personally say that's beautiful. Oh, thank you. And I should, full disclaimer, there were a few photos in there that were not from Alameda. Good to um, know. <laughs> so those, those weren't all Alameda, but uh, but many of them were. Um, and let's see here. I just need to hide this here. There we go. Um, and while, okay. Real quickly, we did get one question. I think it yeah. was answered in the chat, but I think it'd be great for you to answer as well, Ben. Sure. Um, somebody wanted to know, would love to know the differences between Lightroom and Classic. Oh, that's the, that's the question I've been waiting for. So I'm all queued up with my with my uh, <laughs> with my slide deck. I'm a product manager, so I'm required to like slide decks. Yes, um, really not, really, really don't. But um, this is going to be really short. I don't want anybody else to leave. We're going to get to the good stuff in just a second. This is super short, um, and I'm not going to go through a kind of a blow by blow feature comparison here. Um, you can go to the internet and look that up and see big lists of what Lightroom has that Classic doesn't and what Classic has that Lightroom doesn't and, and, and things like that. What I want to talk about very, very fast is just kind of what I see as being the two main differences uh, mm -hmm. between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. All right. And the first is the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So Lightroom Classic um, has local storage, right? You lo you store all of your photos locally on your local hard drive. You organize them in, in folders on your, on your local hard disk. Um, it is designed for use on a single computer. Um, it's designed for use by a single user. Um, and it's really kind of a workstation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this can be um, very appropriate if, for example, you're working with really high volumes of photos um, and you need to kind of manage all of those locally. And then um, on the other side of things, Lightroom uh, has this cloud connection. So every single photo or video that you import into Lightroom, the original gets stored in the cloud. Now, it also can be stored locally on your machine if you wish. Uh, and I can actually show that in just a moment. Um, but regardless of what you choose there, everything full originals get, get synced to the cloud. Um, you can access all of your photos and all of the work that you've done with them on any device. Um, that includes, of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, your computer and your mobile device, but mm -hmm. it can also mean multiple computers. So maybe you have mm -hmm. a computer at home and a computer at work. Do any of us go into an office anymore? I'm sure some people do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe you have a desktop at home and a laptop you take on the road. Maybe that's a better uh, example. Um, and you can work across those seamlessly without having to do the kind of, you know, catalog import and export and whatever yeah. sort of weird workarounds you'd have to do with Classic in order mm -hmm. to accomplish that. Um, it is collaboration enabled. Um, so making it very easy um, to work with, uh, with other people as well. Um, and then there are um, some kind of, you know, benefits to each of those, obviously. I mentioned working with huge photo collections um, in Lightroom Classic. Um, the, the default amount of storage space that you get in the base subscription mm -hmm. with Lightroom is a terabyte. Um, that is more than adequate for most people, but not at all adequate for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, there, are, there are higher storage tiers. I think we currently offer up to 20 terabytes, um, but obviously that costs more as well. So if you have huge photo collections, Lightroom Classic can be a benefit. Um, there's no internet connection needed. Um, I had, then I need a slight footnote there. Like you need a periodic internet connection for logging in and, and auth mm -hmm. you know, authentication kinds of things. And, um, things like, you know, the map module doesn't work yeah. without an internet connection, but basically you don't need an internet connection. Um, in Lightroom, uh, some of the benefits of the cloud connection are you have this backup, you can work across devices, as I mentioned, um, there is some very powerful AI that we can run in the cloud that okay. we couldn't necessarily run very well on your local device, especially like a phone um, that lets us kind of that enables some some cool features um, that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise on um, the cloud connection makes sharing and collaboration um, really easy. And then the cloud connection also enables these built in community and learning resources that are in um, Lightroom, which which can be very, very cool. We can we can take a look at that or, or not. I wasn't specifically going to talk about those, but we can ab absolutely get to that if it's something Perfect. people are interested in. Um, I'll say the one other thing. So that's the first thing, the cloud. That's what mm -hmm. first 
mm-hmm. big difference, difference of the two big differences. Um, and the other thing that I would describe as being the biggest difference is kind of a philosophical difference. And that is that Lightroom Classic provides you with tools to make it easier for you to do your work. And Lightroom tries to provide solutions to avoid mm. the need to do that work. And let me give one example of what I mean um, when I say that. So I think keywording is probably the greatest example of that in, in Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. In Lightroom Classic, there are many, 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 many different tools to help you manually keyword your photos um, so that you can find what you're looking for later on. Uh, whereas in Lightroom, there's a search field and you don't have to keyword anything ever. Mm-hmm. You just type in what you're looking for and it pulls it up without you having to have done any kind of manual tagging in the first place. Um, this is a great example of, of the AI that we can run in the cloud that I was mentioning earlier. So mm-hmm. those are what I see as kind of the two big differences, cloud versus not cloud and kind of tools versus solutions. Perfect. I hope that was a helpful, not too long answer. No, I um, think that was really helpful. And we do have the chat boxes going crazy. <laughs> oh, it's going crazy. All right. Well, if there's more questions coming out of that, let me know and I can absolutely speak to Perfect. that. Perfect. So. And then let's see, someone had a question of, can I change over to Lightroom and work on the same ca- catalogs that was in Lightroom Classic? Yeah. So Lightroom has uh, a feature to um, migrate from Lightroom Classic. So if you say to yourself, oh, this looks fantastic. I want to switch everything over from Lightroom Classic to Lightroom. You migrate your Lightroom Classic catalog or mm. catalogs if you have more than one. That brings them in uh, into Lightroom. And you know all of your edits come along. Um, any you know collections that you would made in, in Lightroom Classic uh, appear as albums in, in Lightroom and so on. So it migrates everything over, and then Perfect. you can work here in Lightroom. So. Beautiful. And then one more question, and then I think we can go ahead and get started after this one. Okay. Um, Somebody said, Bridge is still my go-to program for photos. Why Mm -hmm. should I switch to Lightroom? Well, (laughs) you're going to know the answer to that by the end of today, or at least the end of tomorrow. Um, Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, Bridge Bridge is a a file browser, right? And and super handy um, if if that's what you're looking for. Um, Lightroom is a cloud connected database, which enables all kinds of additional functionality, some of which will be seen today um, and and provides just a ton of of sort of flexibility that you don't get in in a file browser that's just, you know, on a single machine. So awesome. Well, I think that's a great segue into our workflow for today. Let's do it. Okay, let's talk (laughs) about about Alameda Point as it's now known, but it was previously known as hang on. Let me find a picture for you. Uh, oh, look, it was previously known as NAS Alameda, Naval Air Station Alameda. So all of the pictures that I'll be working with today were taken um, in this area of Alameda that was a Naval Air Station and is now a strange wasteland slash urban redevelopment area. Um, so we'll we'll take a look at that. Um, and I am going to go through... Um, kind of my full workflow uh, from mm. just when import has finished, which which I've already imported the photos, um, so I won't make you sit through that. Um, <laughs> but just from when import is finished, we'll go through kind of um, how my my processes for picking out the photos that I want to work with, um, editing and and sharing out those photos, um, and I'm gonna kind of con dense uh, the whole sort of picking out the good ones part of the workflow because I'm not sure like how much of like this everybody wants to sit through (laughs) as I compare it. Do I want this one or that one or that one? Yeah. Um, So I'm going to really condense that part and we'll make it go fast uh, to get quicker to the editing part, um, which is the part that everybody cares about. Um, And in addition to doing that sort of condensing, I'm going to jump ahead right now for just one second to show you one thing that I'm so excited about that I can't wait. Um, and it'll be just a sneak peek. And then we'll come back to it in more detail in a little bit. And that is that, hey, we've gotten to the new features part, the new features in our release that we released <laughs> on Monday. That is the new feature that I'm most excited about, um, which is that you can now work with videos uh-huh. in Lightroom. That is crazy to me. Like that is such, uh, it's such a different world that's now opened up. 
it is super exciting. So you've always been able to import videos into Lightroom. Um, there wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, necessarily a lot of reason to do that. Um, you couldn't really do anything with them once you got them in. Um, you could, um, you know, watch them uh, and maybe edit them, or not edit them, but organize them, you know, into albums or whatever you wanted to do. Um, but you, you couldn't edit them the way that you edit your photos, right? Uh, but in this version of Lightroom, you can now edit your videos using the same editing controls that you use on your photos. And I feel like I need to give a quick little um, sort of, not, not a disclaimer, but a quick little explanation here at the outset. Um, all of the video editing features in Lightroom that I'm showing here today are all GPU enabled. They all run on the GPU. They are super, super fast and smooth and fluid, which I point out, not to brag, um, but to say that if you are seeing kind of choppy video playback or slow frame rate or anything like that, that is not Lightroom. That's just our video sharing connection here. Mm. Um, everything that I'm seeing here within Lightroom um, is super smooth. So you have the ability to use the same controls uh, that you use with your photos now on your videos as well. Um, and I should be clear, Lightroom is not, um, it's not a video editor in the sense of being able to string together multiple mm -hmm. video clips on a timeline or anything like that. That's what Adobe Premiere or Adobe mm -hmm. Rush are for. Um, but uh, for anybody who wants to be able to work with, you know, a single clip um, and make it look its best, we don't want you to have to leave Lightroom to do that. You can now do that work within Lightroom. Um, and that's a very common workflow. Actually, if you look at social media, for example, video sharing is even bigger than photo sharing these days. Um, and very often, you know, you look at your Instagram feed, very often what's mm -hmm. being shared in a video is a single video clip, mm -hmm. right? And so you want to, we want to make that as easy as possible. And then I also want to mention, there's a couple of great things about being able to use um, all of these same controls on video as well as photo. Um, and one is that you, you already know how to do it, right? If you know mm -hmm. how to edit photos in Lightroom, well, guess what? You know how to edit, how to edit videos, videos in Lightroom. Yep. <laughs> um, and the other is that it allows you to achieve a consistent aesthetic between your photos and your videos. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just today I was looking at my, you know, at my Instagram feed this morning, um, looking at some uh, some posts from some fantastic photographers who I follow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there, there's um, in the post, there's several photos and then, and then a video. And the photos all look beautiful and are all meticulously edited. And then the video is just like this video clip of <laughs> the same scene and it doesn't look anything like the rest of it. And uh, so this will let you bring the same look and okay. attention to editing to your, to your videos now as, as well as your photos. So we'll come back to that. We'll look at that in more detail in a minute. Um, but let's let's start with the with the workflow here. So here's what I want to do. Here's the big overview, right? I'm gonna I want to put together uh, an album. So I've got my albums over here. An album, of course, is just a, a collection of of photos mm -hmm. uh, grouped together. Like this is the album of drone photography I was sh showing earlier. So I want to put together an album um, that contains um, not all of these, just the ones that I think are good that I want to share. And then we'll we'll edit those, um, and then tomorrow, and so we'll do all that today. And then mm. tomorrow, when we come back, um, we'll talk about some editing workflow enhancements using presets and batch editing and things like that. Um, and then we'll take a look at um, sharing out the web album and all of the kind of different options that we have for sharing um, out of Lightroom, which are all very cool. Um, Perfect. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create that album. Right, so I'm gonna go over here to my albums panel. I'm just gonna click plus create album. Um, and I am gonna call it uh, Alameda N-A, oop, N-A-S. Great, <laughs> okay. So I have my album there and now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna pick out the ones that I want. And you'll notice here at the beginning, here's a photo and there's another one that's almost identical and there's another one that's almost identical. Um, those are bracketed. Uh, those are bracketed pictures, right? So I, I set the drone to take three pictures at different exposures 
um, every time I press the shutter button. Um, and I, I don't do that all the time, but I have done that for some of these. So if you see things like this, where it's like, hey, the same picture three times in a row, but slightly different exposures, that's mm -hmm. why um, those were bracketed. There are two reasons that I do that. One, of course, is I might want to do HDR. Um, later on. And if anybody doesn't know what that is or wants to learn more about how to do that in Lightroom, I can talk about it. Um, and the other is just that it gives me kind of some exposure options. If the uh, drone kind of missed the ideal exposure, um, mm -hmm. I might kind of get a better one in one of the bracketed um, pictures. So um, for now, I'm just going to pick, you know, kind of the middle exposure of, of each of these if it's one that I want and add that to my album. Now, if I want to add a photo to an album, of course, I can grab it and I can drag it over there. Um, if I want to add multiple photos to an album, I can shift click to select a range or uh, command mm -hmm. click. That would be control click on Windows to select discontiguous ones um, and drag those over. Um, I don't want to put all those in, so let me not do that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I just showed my meeting controls there. I don't want that. Okay. Um, but I don't want to have to kind of go through these and say, okay, I want that one and I want this one. I don't want to have to drag each one because that's a little bit slow. And also it doesn't work great if I'm looking at the photo big because now I can't drag it over there. That's not what that does. I can only drag from the grid view and I don't want to have to go back to the grid view every time I want to add a photo I'm looking at to the album. So I'm going to right click on the album and I'm going to choose set Alameda NAS as the target album. Mm, and okay. now you'll see it says press T to add photos to the target album. It's got a little kind of line around it indicating that it's the target album. And if I press T on my keyboard, the selected photo or photos gets added to that album automatically. Um, and so I can do that while I'm in the loop view here. If I want this photo in there, I can press T, it gets added to the album. Um, if I said, oh, I don't want that, that was a mistake, I can press T again, and it can take it out of the album, and it's telling me, hey, I'm not going to delete it, it's just taken it out of the album, and I say, yes, I understand that, don't show again. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that can be really handy. Um, okay, before I go any farther, I want to give a very high level, have I lost everybody yet? Is there an no. audience out there? Okay. <laughs> You're good, you're good, you're good. Okay, okay. I can't see anybody or, or chat or anything. So um, it's like I'm talking to myself. I'm glad you're here, Adara. <laughs> no, I don't know what are. I'd do otherwise. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk about my selection process. How do you go through? So I have, you know, not, not all 900 of these photos are, are for, for this project, but a lot of them are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, what, what do I have here? Kind of down to... Um, about, right, we're almost there. Here, okay, let me do a shift click to select that range. So 477 of these photos. Well, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna subject anybody to 477 of my photos, right? I just wanna find, you know, a good few. How many am I gonna end up with? I don't know, mm -hmm. 10, 20, but nowhere near 400 and whatever it was. Um, so how do I go through that process? What's my method for picking the good ones? And what, what I do, and this is just what I do, um, everybody has their own approach. Um, but what I do is kind of a three-stage process. And the mm -hmm. first pass is additive, and the second pass is subtractive, and the third pass is ordering. So I'll talk about okay. exactly what I mean there. The, what we're doing right now is the additive pass. So mm -hmm. I created an album that I'm putting these ones into, and now I'm just going through and I'm looking at ones and I'm saying, oh yeah, I like that one. And I'm not being super selective, right? I see mm -hmm. one that I like, you I think- to the album. I add it to the album. You can probably guess what subtractive is. We'll get to it in a minute. We'll go to the album and we'll start pulling things out of the album, mm -hmm. right? Because as soon as I'm in the album, I'll start looking at my picks and say, you know what? These three are actually pretty similar it feels a little redundant. I probably don't need all of those. I'll just have one of them and I'll start pulling stuff out. So I have kind of this first pass where I'm like, ooh, that's good. Ooh, that's good. And I don't think too much about how they're going to go together mm -hmm. or whether I'm being redundant or anything like that. And then we'll come to this second pass in a moment where we'll start throwing stuff out. Um, and then the third pass is I want to I don't necessarily, like these are in chronological order right now, right? And that's not necessarily the order that I want to display them in. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's sort of a story I'm trying to tell, or maybe certain photos just look better next to each other, or maybe I want kind of more sense of variety as somebody goes through the album. So I'll arrange them within the album. Um, all right, so let's do this. Excuse me, let's move on here. Um, I'm going to skip those. And I'm again, I'm just going really fast here. 
Um, and then I want to show you another kind of way that I can work on this additive pass that is really handy. Um, and that is, let's see, let's just start here. I like this. Too bright, too dark. Okay, good. Actually, I'm kind of like the bright one. Um, so I showed pressing T to mm -hmm. add to the album, but there's another thing that I can do here, which is that I can flag photos as pics. And th this is actually what I want to do. Um, and I'll explain why. So I didn't, I haven't flagged these three as pics yet. So let me go back. I'll shift click to select all of them. I'll click on the little flag icon. Now they're all flagged as a pic. Okay. So here's why I want to do that. I want all of these photos that I like, that I looked at and thought, oh, hey, that one's good. I want them flagged as pics so that I can find those good ones later, even okay. if they don't end up making it in the album. Oh, right? okay. So even if you end up removing them from your album and they go back to all photos because they're flagged, you should be still be able to go and find those. Exactly. I still have a record of okay. the ones that I liked, even if I remove them later from the, uh, from the okay. album. Um, so that's why I like to do flagging. So instead of, you know, pressing T right now to add each one that I like to the album, I'm going to flag them as I go along. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you a couple ways to do that. And one is I'm looking at it here and I like that. And I can click on this little mm -hmm. flag icon. I don't know. I don't know if this helps at all. I have this sort of little cursor highlighter thing that can magnify a little bit. Anyway, there it is. Little flag mm -hmm. icon down there. Um, likewise in the grid view. Um, if I roll over a thumbnail, I get the little flag icons. The X one is a reject, rejected. I don't, <laughs> I don't ever reject anything. But. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Neither do yeah, I. there you go. Um, there's also star ratings, which I personally don't really use, but some people do. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's more binary. Is this good? Do I like it? Do I not? I'll, I'll flag it if mm -hmm. I like it. Um, okay, so I don't really want to have to click on those fiddly little buttons. I should mention, by the way, um, for anybody using Lightroom or anybody who comes into Lightroom from the first time, maybe from Lightroom Classic, is there's two different grid views in Lightroom here. Uh, and one of them looks like this. Um, and it, there's just nothing around the photos. It's just your thumbnails. Um, and so you would not see those little, I'm going to turn off this cursor highlighter. Um, you would not see those little uh, you know, flag icons or anything. And the other is this one which is like the detail grid and gives you more kind of info and control. So this is where I, this is the one I like to work in. Okay. I don't want to be going along having to click this tiny button for each of these, obviously. So there is of course a keyboard shortcut. Um, and let's say I won't use that as an example. Hang on. And while you do that, I think once yeah. we go over this, so there's a couple of questions that popped up in the chat that I think would be good to, to cover as well. Okay. Um, so it is, uh, sorry, I'm really like strange and I use the Dvorak, um, keyboard layout instead of the standard QWERTY US layout. And so I don't actually know what any of the keys are if I'm not, <laughs> it's Z, it's Z, I think Z, okay, um, <laughs> is for pick, uh, Anyway, um, I think all the keyboard shortcuts are also listed here next to the commands in the menus. So you can always find the relevant keyboard shortcut there. Um, so there's a keyboard shortcut for making something a pick. It's Z apparently. Um, I wanna show you an even better way that I like so much. And to do that, I'm gonna switch over to Lightroom on my telephone because we live in the future. Mm -hmm. I need a sip of water, hold on. I'll take one too. Mm. All right. Um, so here I am in Lightroom on my phone and look at how everything is syncing. Look at that album that I created on my computer just a moment ago, Alameda Nass with the three photos in it. There it is. All of my work has already just synced mm -hmm. automatically. It's so amazing. Um, so I'm going to go into all photos here. Here's all these pictures that I was looking at. Um, how far did I get down here? I don't know. I, uh, let's take a look at this one. Okay. So I like, and, and realistically i might use a tablet for this because it's a little bit bigger but mm -hmm. but but full full disclosure I, I totally do do this on my phone as well especially for this first kind of additive pass that i'm talking about with you here so what i've done is i tapped on all photos to go in and see the photos i tapped on another uh, on the photo i want to look at it to see it bigger and i'm in you'll see up here where it says edit right i'm in edit mm -hmm. i've got all these edit controls at the bottom we'll be talking about that a little bit later okay but this is a menu as indicated by that little 
what is that little triangle there? Mm -hmm. So I tap it and I have this, uh, uh, these other options, one of which is rate and review. So I'm going to tap on that. Okay. Um, you see, I have these same controls down here now, stars and the, uh, and the flags and so on down there. Um, I've got this film strip at the bottom so I can kind of go through and, and uh, look at the next ones. Of course, mm -hmm. I can swipe back and forth. Um, if I, uh, oh, that was a little weird. If I turn this, hey, that worked. Does that look, is it, am, I, am I in landscape? Are you seeing yes. me in landscape? Okay, yes. great. Everything, all the technology is working for us today. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so there's a lot going on here and my photo's kind of small. So I'm going to tap once boop, and hide all of that, make mm -hmm. the photo big. Okay, so now I'm looking at my photo and I say, hey, I like this one. All I need to do is swipe up on the right hand side of the photo like so. And I have just flagged it. If I swiped down, I could unflag it. If I swipe down more, I could reject it. Um, so I can go through my photos and I can just say, oh, rejected, uh, neutral, oh, flagged. And it's mm -hmm. really quick. Just swipe to the next photo, swipe to the next photo, wow. swipe up to flag. And it's just so fast and fluid and so much just such a different vibe than sitting in front of your computer or yes. going through, you know, and it's this really kind of beautiful, fluid experience. And you can do it on the couch, like you said. Yes. Um, <laughs> you can do it at the bus stop. You can do it in the waiting room at the dentist, yes. you know, whatever. Like editing photos, that is, that's the fun part, mm -hmm. right? I think. And I don't mind sitting at my computer to edit photos, but going through 400 and whatever photos to find that's the 10 lot. good ones, that's not really the great part. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and so anything to kind of make that experience more enjoyable and more flexible um, is great. And it's something because this is something because everything syncs to the cloud and Lightroom and all your work syncs back and forth mm -hmm. um, it, and everything's accessible to you on your phone. It's something you can do in downtime. Mm -hmm. you know just so it's it's very very cool i think um, that's why i like this feature a lot because um for me personally i do uh, when i shoot i usually come back with a lot of photos to select through so it could be 300 400 if, it, if i shot for example two weeks ago i shot a wedding um and if, making the selections is the most dreading <laughs> process <laughs> because you have, you have so many photos even like 300 photos is a lot of photos to go through and select and so doing it at a computer is very very draining um so yep. i like the flexibility here and being able to do it and because you can do it on a phone or a tablet it's so easy to just swipe and use your fingers and go up and down and select um so i think that is definitely a great feature there it is it is really really handy and if you are looking at this and saying that's great but i use star ratings well mm -hmm. if you swipe up and down on the left side of the photo you get the star ratings mm -hmm. so i don't ever really do that but some people mm -hmm. do um so you've got that there as well all right so that is kind of the selection process that i particularly like um for now i'm going to switch back to my computer because i think what i'll really do instead of actually looking at each of these pictures carefully um, is I'm just going to kind of look in grid view here and and pick some of them out. So, um, okay. So you, you can see, like I flagged this photo a moment ago over on my computer or on my phone and it's flagged here on my desktop, right? That work that I did is here. Mm -hmm. um, so that is really great. Um, and where are Let's see, is there another one? And while yeah. you do that, Ben, I'm going to yeah. go ahead and see what questions we got in the chat, just so okay, I don't miss great. any. Yeah. Let me see. Um, there was a question, and I don't know how much you can speak to this now, but I didn't want to call it out. Um, someone was speaking about Lightroom and Capture One, mm -hmm. um, and how like in Capture One, the fluid color technology, as well as its ability to tether properly. Um, do you know, or can you give any insight of whether or not Lightroom will at any point in the future be able to address things of like of that nature? Um, so I can't speak in any specific way to future plans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I can say is that you guys are why we're here, right? And we're mm -hmm. always listening to our customers and we're always striving to move Lightroom in the direction that our customers want and need. Um, and so we, we pay attention to the things that people ask for. Um, so I can Absolutely. say that. I, I can't speak specifically about future plans. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah. And then the oh. next question is, um, so, so going back to the video editing that you were doing before, they had asked us, is there um, local adjustments on video? Is there a video edit also in Lightroom Classic? So the first question, are there local adjustments on videos? No, there's not local mm -hmm. adjustments on videos. So when we get into the editing in more detail in just a, a little bit, um, we'll take a look at that. There are some edits that you can do with still photos that you can't do with videos um, and local adjustments are one of those. Um, in terms of the editing videos in Lightroom Classic, um, Lightroom Classic already has some video capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, you can trim uh, clips and you can do some limited editing via the quick develop panel in Lightroom Classic. Um, but the full kind of editing that you're seeing here with the controls in the edit panels, um, that is an improvement that's limited to Lightroom here. That's not in Lightroom Classic. Perfect. And then I think this is the last question and hopefully I'm not, no, there's two more questions. So one is again, going back to the video, are you able to edit a video based on edits to a still image next to the video? Oh, you're just jumping ahead. <laughs> Short answer, we... yes. Long answer, we're gonna totally get to that. Beautiful. Um, that and and maybe we can. Hey, you got to come back tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so tomorrow is where I have planned to talk about um, kind of batch editing stuff, um, which includes you know copy paste between different assets mm -hmm. and presets and all that sort of stuff. Um, maybe we'll end up getting a little sneak peek of that today. I'm not, we'll we'll see how the time goes. Yes. Um, but. Uh, Yes, and that is absolutely something that I will, um, that I'll be talking about. Yes, that's a part of our plan, so that's perfect. And then the last question is, in Lightroom, while in grid mode, is there an info view? In Lightroom in grid mode, is there an info view? Uh, you mean like this? Let me see. I'm wondering. ask that question let me make sure i'm not forget sean can you clarify if this is what you were looking for because if so the answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> perfect perfect thank you so much ben for answering those questions yeah no problem um so i'm just going through here and i'm, I'm just flagging some stuff and it's a little bit arbitrary i mean when i you know at some point i'll probably go back and do this you know for real mm -hmm. um but uh um I don't, I don't want to make you guys sit through too much of that. Everybody sit through this, but um, so let me talk about, hey, let me talk about another new feature in this version of Lightroom. Um, this will make all of the Lightroom Classic customers yawn, but uh, because Lightroom Classic has this, but uh, Lightroom has not had this until now, um, which is a, a, a compare view so that you can compare two photos side by side. So if I'm trying to decide between this one and that one, and I can go back and forth between them. <laughs> um, but I can also now go into compare view, which is this little button down here. And it'll say, hey, pick, uh, pick another photo from the film strip. Uh, and I say, yes. And now I can look at these two photos side by side. Um, so that's just a handy. I can also hide the side panels if I need them to be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I pressed tab there, by the way, just to hide Perfect. those side panels. Um, and I can you know, zoom and they're, they're, they're synced here. Um, if I want to be able to do that independently, I can click down here and turn off that link so I can uh, pan them and zoom them independently. Um, I also have a few view options up here if I wanna view them top and bottom versus side by side. Mm -hmm. um, but so this can just be a handy aid to um, sort of picking out picking out the pictures that you wanna work with is this side by side view. Um, and this is new in Lightroom um, as of Monday. So Perfect. that's pretty cool. Um, all right, we'll say we want that one. And uh, just gonna pick out a few others here. This, I mean, here's a, here's a boat. So obviously we want that one. Um, okay, here's, look at that, NASA Alameda. Which of these do we want? I like this one, great. Yes. Um, so, and all I'm doing here, I'm just going through real fast. I'm tapping on that Z key to flag them. Um, here we go, that looks nice. Uh, and and like I said, I'm not being too picky, right? I'm picking out mm -hmm. candidates here right now. So stuff that stuff that could work. Um, that looks nice, that looks nice. Uh, and oh, that one's a little bright. Let's do, um, let's do this one instead. Um, 
And then, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, the bracketing, if as I'm editing some of these, I, I find, ooh, I would really benefit from more dynamic range in this. Did I, did I take this one bracketed? Um, if I did, I can go back and I can pull in the other pictures and create an HDR from it. Mm -hmm. We can we can talk about that if if uh, if that's of interest to people. Yes, let us know if that's what y'all want to hear a little bit more about in the chat box. Yeah, and you you know you all of you who are watching today, thank you so much. And you can you can steer this presentation. So tell me the stuff yes. that you want to that you want to learn about. Ooh, look at this. Look at this. Here, this is good. Here's one. I think oh, that's okay. But look at that one with the sun peeking through. That's better. Okay, let's mm -hmm. go with that one. Um, okay, so that's good. We're, we're, we're making good progress here. I'm not going to make you sit through too much more. Of this. <laughs> um, but I do want to be sure we have enough kind of material to work with. Uh, and then we have one more question. It's a question from YouTube. Is it possible to set the orders of keywords or do we still have to, do we still have it in alphabetical order by default? So if you're keywording your photos, let me switch here. That Here's the keywording panel in Lightroom. So I'll go here. You'll notice that it is quite simple compared to Lightroom Classic. Um, if you're keywording your photos manually, um, you could type in here and, and say um, boat. Um, and this will, this will be in, in a alphabetical list here. There's no kind of reordering the keywords that you've applied. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, when I talked about sort of the main differences between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, you don't necessarily have to do that work of manually keywording things in, in Lightroom. Now, you might need to, depending on your specific needs, you know, if you are um, selling photos through stock agencies, for example, you need exhaustive and very specific keywording for those, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that is something that you would legitimately need to do manually. If you are really more just keywording so that you can find your own stuff later on, mm -hmm. um, you might find that you don't need to do that in Lightroom. And instead here, I can just search, right? So I'm up at the top, whoop, hang on. See, when you're in Zoom, pressing escape does something different. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is the search field and I will just type boat. And now it finds boats for me, right? So let's take a look here. Let's go up to the top. Um, okay, so none of these are things that I've keyworded, mm -hmm. um, except for that one that you saw me keyword just now. Um, instead, it's just looking in the pictures and finding boats, and you'll see that it's not perfect, right? So if perfection mm -hmm. is something that you need as well, um, then maybe manually is the way that you have to go. But it can be quite good and quite handy. And what it does here is it has ordered these results based on confidence. So I think, let's check. Yes. So the ones at the top, it's like really sure are a boat. And the ones, you know, all the way at the bottom, it's less sure are a boat. Um, and most of these are pretty boatish. Uh, this is not a boat, but it is a platform floating in the water covered with seals. Um, so that's cool. Uh, so that's that's the really kind of great approach of Lightroom is, I mean, who wants to sit and keyword their photos? Literally nobody. Even the people who need to do it don't want to do it. In fact, probably mostly the people who need to do it don't mm -hmm. want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's not a need of yours and it's just something you're doing so you can find things later on, um, you probably don't have to do it. You can probably just do this search in Lightroom and that powerful AI that runs in the cloud will look at your photos and find the boats and give you the photos here. And awesome. here's a, here's the thing that's great. Now, I have a zillion pictures as part of this project that we're working on together right now. I have a lot of pictures of these ferries at the, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Alameda ferry. It's not the terminal. It's like a what would you call it? A garage? <laughs> a I ferry so. marina? Yeah. yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> a, a, how about a depot? I don't know. It's where the ferries go to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> And, you know, if I'm going through here and, and I'm seeing some of these, you know, I have a lot of these that I took and, I, and maybe the results when I search for boat, maybe it happens to not find the exact one that I was looking for, but that's probably okay, right? Because if it, if it finds one, I can, I can right click on it and I can say, oh, where is it? Um, I'm totally not seeing it. Uh, Oh, what I'm looking for, yeah, there we go. Show photos from same date. Mm. So now I click on that 
And now it's showing me all the pictures that I took on that day. And so maybe if it missed the specific one that I was looking for, I can still find it really easily. It just needs to find me something. And then I, and that, and then like, oh, okay, that was that day. And it can take me right to the day and I can find what I'm looking for. Mm. Um, and you'll see when I did that here, it expanded the date view over here. It expanded the year and the month. And it oh, took me wow. to the day here with that photo highlighted. So, um, so that's that, that kind of level of search ability um, can kind of obviate the need for manual keywording for many people, not for everyone. Ooh, did I answer that question by talking for 10 minutes? Uh, <laughs> I think you answered it in great depth. So thank you so I much. I over answered the question. No, um, more is always better. More is always better. <laughs> okay. So I'm still just going through uh, making some, making some picks here. Keep the questions coming. And this isn't going to be yes. too much longer. I'm almost done. Uh, almost done with this part of things. Uh, so yes. Um, if y'all have any questions, please make sure you put them in the chat. Um, I know Sean had put some clarification as far as that when it came to that info, like photo name, size, format. I believe when you showed the info panel, I saw that. Yeah, so we have, um, you know, EXIF data here. So the camera metadata is mm -hmm, up here. There you go. Um, including the dimensions and also the file size Perfect. and file, file type. Um, and here's the file name. Um, you can put in certain metadata yourself, title, caption. Um, there's you, you can edit the capture date if you happen to have the clock set wrong on your camera when you mm -hmm. took the picture um and then it gives location info right these pictures have gps coordinates in the metadata mm -hmm. um and so it tells me you know i didn't have to enter any of this manually it tells me where it was taken and it shows it on the map um and down at the bottom here it it um uh, it tells me the sync status. So it tells me what's in the cloud, the original, and what do I have locally right now? Also the original. Mm. Um, and there's, and actually maybe this is a great opportunity for me to just detour really quickly. Um, you know, when you're working in Lightroom, everything gets stored in the cloud. So you don't need to store your photos locally on your machine. If you have a laptop with limited hard drive space and you have five terabytes of photos, um, those photos can be in the cloud. They don't have to be locally on your machine, um, Lightroom can have smart previews locally on your machine, which are reduced size, compressed DNGs. So they're still raw, um, but they're much, much smaller, um, about a megabyte each versus whatever your, I mean, this one is 24 megabytes, you know, whatever your, your camera takes. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still do all of your ordering and, and sorting and searching and, and, and you can do all of your editing with the smart preview. So it's very, very flexible. Um, if you need the original, um, Lightroom will pull it down automatically from the cloud as long as you have an internet connection. Um, if you don't have an internet connection, um, you can work with the smart previews that are already on your machine. Or if you can kind of plan ahead and you say, you know what, I have this, um, you know, I have this album of photos here and I know I'm going to want to work with this and I'm going to be on an airplane or I'm going to be in the middle of the desert or I'm going to be somewhere where I don't have internet access. You can make sure that all of the photos in that album are stored locally ahead of time. Mm. Um, so you would go up here and you're not going to see the, the, the menu item I am about to tell you about will not appear here. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, but you would see a menu item here that said store this album locally. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll show you what that looks like over on the phone um, because the phone has the same option. So I'm here on the phone and I can go into, uh, I'm looking at uh, my drone album here. I can tap on that three dot menu and here I have store locally as an option. And so I can tap that and it'll say, hey, here's how much space it's gonna take on your device. Here's how much space you have left mm -hmm. in your device. I say, that all sounds great, download. And now you can see that little progress bar as it's downloading um, the photos that are in this album. And it will keep those photos locally on the, the device, device until I turn off store locally. So if I'm gonna be offline, mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about not having access to that, to that stuff. Um, now, let me go back here to Lightroom on my computer for a moment and explain the reason why you don't see that uh, option here, which, which normally you would, or by default you would, um, which is that for, for me, I want, I have lots of hard drive space on this computer and I want an original copy of all of, all of my photos stored locally on this machine 
all the time. Mm -hmm. I also want them in the cloud, but I want them locally as well. I don't want them stored just in the cloud. So I've gone into the preferences and I've gone to the local storage options here and I have checked this checkbox for store a copy of all originals. Mm -hmm. And then I can pick where I want it to go. So, um, you know, I have a really big external hard drive, um, redundant RAID, um, excuse me. So I would pick that as my location um, and then it stores a copy of all of those locally. And since it's already storing a copy of every single photo in the library locally, it doesn't have the per album option. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, got it. Got um, it. I don't even remember what question I was answering there. I'm <laughs> sure I got off track, but uh, I hope that was interesting and useful for us. It was for sure. For sure. <laughs> oh. And I think this is, we were about halfway through this stream thus far. So again, if you are just joining us, welcome, whether you are over on YouTube or you're watching on Behance, welcome, welcome, welcome. If y'all have any questions for Ben, we are going over the new features in Lightroom that released on Monday. And so if y'all have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I think we got one more question. Um, and then we can kind of keep going forward. Um, somebody asked, does Lightroom have a way to add GPS data from a GPX log like you can like you can with a map mobile in Lightroom class? Yeah, the answer to that is totally no. Mm. Which can you tell how I feel about that? Yeah. Who can I talk <laughs> about this? <laughs> Wait, that's me. Um, so if your photo already has GPS metadata in it, which many photos do, the, <clears throat> the camera that uh, many of us use uh, mm -hmm. more often than any other um, does that, um, the, this drone obviously does that. Um, if those coordinates are already there, then great. And you'll see that info here. Um, if not, there is not currently a way to add that um, in Lightroom. The way that there is in Lightroom Classic, um, I would love to be able to do that because I am I'm a I'm a big I'm a big GPS user. Um, if you uh, you know if you are someone who actually kind of goes to the trouble of recording a track log, um, then uh, you would need to embed that track or sync that track log with your photos prior to importing them into Lightroom. So mm -hmm. I use one. Um, uh, what do I use? I use uh, I use Geotag Photos. This is not an endorsement. I'm not getting any money from them. Um, and and then they they provide the ability to um, embed the GPS. So you record this records a track log on the phone, and then they provide the ability to embed that GPS into photos that you were taken with some other camera. Um, and I I do that prior to importing them into Lightroom. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> extra step outside of Lightroom there, not ideal. Would love to get to that someday. Perfect. So, um, okay, uh, halfway through. All right, we got to get to the good stuff. We gotta we gotta talk about editing. Um, let me uh, let me finish this because we're we're close here. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> like a bus, a weird double decker bus. See all the w wonderful things I can discover in my hometown here. <laughs> Crazy. Um, okay. Here we go. Were I'm you just... just walking around one day and you were like, oh, I want to take a picture of that bus. Like, how did you find yourself in all these different locations? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a great question. So I do walk and actually more frequently bicycle around um, Alameda wow. Point, uh, NASA Alameda. <clears throat> um, and I find stuff like that. But I also, and this is a great example. What What is this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Here's something that I do, and I don't know if you're gonna, am, am I just a huge nerd or what? Um, I open the Maps app. Here is Alameda Point. Here, this area here, this is, this is a, this street here is the border of it. And everything, all these pictures that we're looking at here were taken within this area. Mm -hmm. And I will just look on the map and browse around. And I was doing that, that I saw this. And I was like, what is that? Let's go take drone pictures of that. And, <laughs> and this is a great example of why drone photography can be so cool. Because if you are standing on the ground, like these aren't that interesting, mm -hmm. you know? Um, okay, you know what? Okay, it's just not that interesting. But if you're up in the air, 
you know, it's it's way you really get that view of the of these things, these strange things, which I assume are foundations of buildings that are no longer there, but I'm not mm -hmm. really sure. So I discovered that just looking at the maps app because I'm weird and I like to just kind of browse around and look at where could I go and take pictures? <laughs> what is this? Mm. Um, and another thing, whoop, too far. Another thing I discovered doing that is this where it says NAS Alameda painted on the runway. And so I, I would have had no idea. Oh, wow. Um, and there's no way I could have known that that was there because it's completely flat and you can't see it. And hang on, this is zoom is a little twitchy. Right here along this line here across the whole island is a chain link fence. Um, so you're not, this is closed. You're not allowed to go here onto this runway area. Um, so I would never have found that. Um, and even if I had found it, I never, without trespassing, I never would have been able to take a picture of it mm -hmm. with a regular camera because um, I couldn't reach it. And even if I was trespassing and stood there, what would that picture look like with me standing on the ground? Probably not super interesting. But as it was, I could stand right here, right here <laughs> and fly my drone. Wow, and get that shot. And get that picture. It was about a mile. Aren't drones amazing? Yes, I need amazing. a drone myself. I need a drone myself. <laughs> yeah, they're so, so amazing. And here's something I do. So I mentioned I ride my bicycle around. When I ride my bicycle, I wear a yellow reflective vest for safety. Um, and it looks, you know, kind of like a work vest or something that people wear when they're sort of an official person doing something. And drone photography can, all, can sometimes be a little, like make people a little edgy. And mm. so when I'm flying the drone, I leave the vest on. Yes. Because I look very official. And even if I don't look official, <laughs> I at least don't look like I'm trying to hide. Yes. Right? <laughs> when I was standing right here, taking those pictures where it says NASA Alameda on the runway, there were a couple of guys over here, sort of just barely within earshot of me, obviously talking about me and my legitimacy or lack thereof. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, I missed the beginning of what they said, but I heard the guy's reply where he says, anyone can wear a yellow vest. I have a yellow <laughs> vest in my car. And so <laughs> right? clearly the first guy was like, oh no, I think he's, uh, you know, he must be uh, an official guy. Look at his vest. <laughs> All right. As usual, I've spent too long answering a question. No. I love digressions. I love digressions. No, makes a, it makes the live stream <laughs> so much more fun. So no, it was a um, nice little laugh. <laughs> all right. If you, everybody wants to cry, I can talk about what happened to one of the two drones I used while taking oh. these pictures. Yeah. <laughs> all right. You're not here for my tale of woe, though. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to that if we need to fill time. <laughs> I don't think I that's going to be a problem, though. I don't think so. I, I love the shot of the basketball court, though. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, this is look at this. I mean, a basketball court with trees growing out of it. <laughs> that's pretty neat. OK. Um, Good, good, good. So I think we've we've kind of got what we need here. I think, oh, we're not quite done. We're almost done, but we haven't gotten, there's the ferry terminal and there's the, um, oh, and there's this weird building. Hey, this is, okay, again, not gonna spend too much time here, but let me just say really quickly. Um, so all of these old buildings, I mean, who knows what this was for originally, um, but many of them are being repurposed uh, into businesses today. So they're not abandoned anymore, even though some of them look like it. Oh, well, some of them are, but but many of them aren't. Um, there's a huge sports complex and an aircraft hangar. There's breweries and aircraft hangars. Um, this building, I believe, is in use by Astra, which is a rocket company that builds orbital rockets. Their most recent launch um, just flew out of control up in orbit with a NASA satellite on it last week. Sorry, Astra. Um, and they're like building and testing rockets in here, oh, wow. uh, which is pretty amazing. Every my my daughter's preschool, where she went to preschool, was a a few blocks from here. And every once in a while, we would hear this sound that sounded like the end of the world, and we didn't know what it was. But now I know that it was rocket engine testing. Oh. Um, so really, some interesting interesting stuff around here. Okay, we're almost done here. Thank you, everybody, for being such a. <laughs> Are the numbers dwindling? Don't tell me. Okay. No, I think we're good. I think we're good. And again, if y'all have more questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, whether you are on YouTube or Behance. Any questions that you all have on this new Lightroom update, we can definitely make sure to answer it. If not today, for sure tomorrow. All right. Okay. I'm through every... Oh, man, so many furry pictures. We'll just get, we'll get one or two. And then we, we have to have the seals because come on. Yes. We can't miss the seals. Look at the seals. 
this platform was, um, there used to be a decrepit falling apart dock or something out here that the seals would relax on. And oh. the dock got torn down and this platform was oh. custom built, purpose built for the seals to relax on, which I love. I love um, that. Okay. All right. So I've made my selections. Now, I, if you were paying super, super close attention, which you probably were not, and who can blame you, um, you might've noticed that I did not select any videos. And the reason that I didn't select any videos is that selecting videos is time consuming because you need to mm -hmm. watch the video. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have cheated and I went through and selected, I picked videos already before the stream started today because I didn't want to make you have to sit through all that. <laughs> okay, so I have gone through everything. I have flagged my picks, the ones that I want. I need to get them into this album. So I want to see just the ones that I've picked. So I'm going to go up here to the right of the search field is this little button. It's like a funnel and I will click it. And this allows me to filter the view of the photos in the grid view here so that it only shows photos that meet certain criteria. I am, I am funneling down the photos so that it only shows me the ones I'm interested in. There's all kinds of things that I can filter on here. Um, you know, location, uh, camera, there's there's all kinds of things. Um, but one of the things I can filter on is flag status. So mm. I will click the button for the flag. Here's some that are flagged that aren't from this um, shoot, this, this uh, project. Um, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to go up here. I'm going to select the first one from the project, the first flagged one, and I'll just go down to where the project starts here. Seals, seals. There we go. Okay. So these are all of the flagged pictures for this project. I will drag them and drop them into here. I picked 115 of the 400 whatever. And so what I would do now, I'll just X out of that search so I can see all of my photos again. I'm gonna close mm -hmm. that filter bar. Um, I'll go into the album. Um, so here they all are. And I would go through here uh, and whittle, weed them out right, as I described mm -hmm. earlier. Now, I'm not actually gonna bother with that right here while you all are sitting here. I wanna get on to the editing, mm -hmm. um, but my, so probably after the stream today and before we start tomorrow, I'll probably go through and kind of whittle this album down a little bit. Um, but for now, I think we should just move on uh, and talk about editing. Are there any questions that have come in that I could answer um, before I do that and while I take a sip of water? No, I think we okay. are at a good point to move into the photo editing. I'm sure once we do that, that the questions will start to flow in again. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so here I am, I'm, I wanna work on this photo here. Um, and uh, I've actually already worked on it a little bit. I will undo the edits that I've done um, and kind of show you my process. Um, of, of course, I'm still looking at the info here because I opened the info. I opened the info panel. Um, mm -hmm. So I need to go back into the edit panel up here in the upper right. So now I have my edit controls. And at the bottom of the edit panel, is, you'll see this um, button called versions. I'm going to click there to open this up. And versions are really interesting for anybody who is accustomed to Lightroom Classic. Versions is sort of a combination of snapshots and history in Lightroom mm -hmm. Classic. So what we have here, up at the top, you see it says named. I have two different tabs under versions, named and auto. So named versions are just like snapshots in Lightroom Classic, which means that if I have an edit that I kind of want to save, I can do that. So I'll click the plus to create a version. I'm just going to call it edit, call it whatever you want. So now I have this edit. So I have this original. This is what it looked like. This is my edit. OK, great. I've saved that version. And now if I go and I do experiments with some other stuff and, and I'm like, oh, geez, Louise, um, I don't know about that. And I want to go back to my edit. I can do that easily. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I want um, a black and white version. And so I can make a uh, it's not really that good, is it? But anyway, it doesn't matter. I can make a black and white version and I can call it, you know, black and white. And then I can easily switch between my versions. So mm -hmm. that's the manual versions. That's like snapshots in Lightroom Classic. Um, there are also auto versions um, and these get saved. It's not quite like history in Lightroom Classic. So anybody who uses Lightroom Classic and, and looks at the history panel, you know that it saves every single mm -hmm. thing that you do. So if you move the um, slider like for exposure from zero to 2.27, that's a history step in Lightroom mm -hmm. Classic. And then if you move it back to zero, 
that's another history step in classic. Mm -hmm. So even though the net result was nothing, you have two history steps in classic. It's very, very, very granular. Yeah. Um, Lightroom doesn't do that. Instead, it just saves, automatically saves versions at kind of key moments um, in your mm -hmm. process. Um, so, and it also saves auto versions in some other contexts as well. Um, for example, and we're gonna talk about this tomorrow, in Lightroom, you can edit collaboratively with people. So mm -hmm. if I wanted you to be able to edit the photos in this Alameda NAS album, I could share it with you. I could give you edit permissions. And when you made edits, your edits would show up as auto oh, versions wow. in here um, so that they're not, um, uh, or actually, no, I think they show up in named, but shows up at versions so that your edits I would see your edits and it would be your edit on the photo if you'd edited it more recently. Um, but my edit would be saved as a version. Your edit would be saved as a version. I could switch back and forth between them really easily. So um, so that's versions. Um, so I mentioned that just because I did a little edit in here already. I wanted to save that as my version. I just did that. I'm gonna close the versions panel um, and I'm gonna reset this photo. So I'm clicking here just on the three dot menu and I'm choosing reset edits. Okay. I'll talk a little bit about my process on this photo and I'm going to do two photos here and then I'm going to do a video. So we'll get to the video um, very shortly here. Um, and what I love about this photo in particular, this is the, the USS Hornet. This is a decommissioned aircraft carrier. This is the ship that picked up the Apollo 11 astronauts when they returned from the moon. How cool is that? Wow. Um, and so that's docked here in Alameda. It is uh, open to the public as a museum. Um, what I really like about this picture is that it just, it looks like kind of end of days, you know? It's like this grungy, decrepit, like war machine. This is probably the alien invasion has happened and it's not going well for us. I, I, am I putting too much into it here? This is the vibe I'm getting off of this photo. <laughs> Um, and so that's kind of what I want to bring out in this mm -hmm. picture. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to get like too philosophical about my editing here because I think you're probably all more interested in how does Lightroom work, um, and less interested in how do I work. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I do when I approach editing a photo is I try to make it more of what it is. Mm. I look at a photo and I say, what, what drew me to this photo? And then I'm going to try to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. right? And so this is like, oh yeah, but this is, this is grungy and, and, and a little bit threatening maybe. And that, that's kind of the things I want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just going to, you know, kind of, I'm going to do a little contrast. I don't know, maybe a little bit of exposure, but I still want those darks to be really dark. Um, I'm going to maybe Warm it up a little bit. Yeah, that looks good. The kind of an apocalyptic sky there. Let me take this contrast down just a second here. There we go. Okay, this is looking nice. Those are very small edits, but I'm already liking it a little bit better. But I, I have a problem here. And the problem that I have is this right here. Welcome aboard. That is way <laughs> too cheery, right? Way, way too cheerful yes, for the end of well, days. Yep. Um, right, so I don't want that there. So I wanna get rid of that. And actually, um, let me show you a, a cool thing here in Lightroom. So. Um, if I just click like that, it zooms to one to one. Well, this is a, uh, however big it is, 12 megapixel photo or something mm -hmm. like that on a 5K display. That's not much of a zoom. Um, so if I wanna see it, if I wanna zoom in more, I can click down here on the zoom menu and I can zoom way in or I can zoom way out. Okay, that's all great, um, but I don't wanna really have to manually select from this menu. So there's two other things that I can do, which I do all the time. And one is I can hold down command, mm -hmm. that would be control on Windows. And that gives me a little box that I draw around the thing I wanna look at and it zooms to the box. Mm. Um, so that is handy. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I can do is if I, as I mentioned a moment ago, if I click it zooms to one-to-one, -to -one. but if I, if I click and hold, it gives me this little zoom cursor. And then I can just, I'm, all I'm doing is dragging the mouse left and right here. And so that that is a way to kind of really easily just zoom in mm -hmm. on something that you want to take a quick look at. Um, so that's that's handy. Um, let's, let's, well, I don't want to zoom that much, but um, actually let's keep the big picture view here. And I'm going to go into heal. So here I'm in the edit controls in the upper left. Here are Here is the healing brush. So I'm going to go into heal. I'm going to get a good brush size. I'm just scrolling up and down on my mouse here to change the size of the brush. It's a little too big. 
And then I'm just gonna go over, welcome aboard, because that's way too cheerful. <laughs> I love how you gave us the idea of like the story behind the image, because (laughs) now that you point that I'm like, yeah, no. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I didn't really like the spot it picked originally. So I moved it. That looks better to me. Like, does that look perfect? If I zoomed in, probably not. Is anybody ever going to notice anything there? Absolutely. 100% Mm. not. Um, And while we're at it, let's get rid of USS Hornet banner. Okay, great. That looks much better. I'm much happier with that. Um, so just a couple simple edits there. Um, I want to show, and did I actually, when I was, I don't think I actually picked the photo that I wanted to use this on. Yeah, I did. Here we go. Nope, not that one. This one. Okay. Um, so another uh, approach, and here, look, so this is not, it's not active duty, but they they sometimes, sometimes um, Army Reserve, it's probably not Army Reserve, it's probably Navy Reserve, I have no idea. Anyway, sometimes Reserve um, people, they they bunk them on the boat sometimes, on the Hornet. Anyway, there were a bunch of people watching me fly the drone around, military people. <laughs> can I, I know that I've been just the king of digressions here. Um, can I digress for just a second? Yes. Um, because this is maybe a, a good segue. This was, you know, there, there are all these Army, sorry i apologize for anybody in the military i'm i don't know my terminology these may not be army people but i believe um reserve people military reserve people um and they're on the ship and they're walking around in the area and there's some tents behind me and so on and um they're doing their important work and i hear this woman and i think she was kidding um say there's a drone what if it tries to shoot me should i report this all right <laughs> and she's being funny right um but uh always be safe and always be legal. Yes. Right. Yes. People be can be really touchy about drones and you want to be, you, let me, let me make that a list of three things. Always be safe, always be legal and always be polite. Yes. Don't annoy people. Don't endanger people. Don't break the law. It used to be. And some of these photos that I showed you at the start are f- taken a long time ago. Um, I've been doing drone photography for about five years. It used to be hard to okay it used to be there were no laws <laughs> it was the wild west and then there kind of were laws and regulations and it was this horrible mishmash and they changed every 20 minutes and it was very difficult to even know what the legal thing was at any given time and all of that is past us now it is it's the laws are clear and complying with them is super easy mm-hmm. um so this area I do want to show you something on my phone in just a second. Before I do, this area right here is not far from the Oakland airport. This is an authorization zone, meaning it's like you cannot fly here without permission. Mm-hmm. But this is this is not hard or a big deal. So I want to I want to show you this really quickly. Um, you can get permission for this kind of thing in real time. There are several different oh. apps for this. Um, I the one this is the one I use the most often is Aloft, but there are others as well. Um, so. That green dot is where I am right now. You all know where I live now. Um, And you can see all of these circles of different colors are areas where there's like issues of one sort or another with flying, right? And for basically because of other air traffic, but sometimes for other reasons, like if you look Mm -hmm. here, that whole island is red, which means absolutely not under any circumstances. And that's because that's um, a Coast Guard base, right? but these other circles, you know, mean other things. They're not red. Um, here's here's the Oakland airport. So you can see we're pretty close to that. Um, but I live within this purple zone, which is an auth- which means it's an authorization zone. You can't fly without permission. And I live in that zone and there's the Hornet. So all but the very stern of the Hornet is within the authorization zone, right? Oh, so, wow. but what you can do is you just tap and you say, get authorization and it says what do you want are you commercial or recreational i'm recreational how high do you need to fly well where i am right now you can see it's drawn a little box around around my house where i am i'm only authorized to fly up to 100 feet here that's for safety because of other air traffic um but over here by the hornet i'm allowed up to 200 feet so i can you know move this area of where and specify where I want to fly and I get it around here over to the Hornet. And then I can say, okay, you know, up to 200 feet and I tap next and it grants permission on the spot. Oh, wow. You tell it where you tell it when you tell it how high it says, yes, you can do that. 
you now have FAA permission to do this. Wow. Um, and hit it. so that's not it. Um, and so here are my all of my um, approval requests from the FAA for each of those flights that I was doing. Um, so it's very, very easy. Uh, the drone needs to be registered. That takes three minutes. You can do it on the internet. It costs $5. This is, sorry, let me back up because I know we have an international audience. This is the US. So mm -hmm. yes. things, may, <laughs> things may vary where you yes. are. Yes, yes. Um, but this is the US. Um, and the drone needs to be registered. It's very quick. You do it online. It costs $5. It lasts three years. And you need to be certified. Even as a recreational flyer, that takes about 30 minutes. I think it was free. And then you get a little piece of paper that says you're certified. Um, so there's, I, I, sorry, I know I spent longer on that than I meant to, <laughs> but, what, but it's so important to be safe yes. and kind and polite and legal. Yes. Um, and, and it's so easy now that there's no reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and what okay. was the name of that after? Uh, oh, someone answered, someone asked and then somebody answered. So it was called Aloft, correct? Yeah, yeah, Perfect. Aloft. And Aloft. Um, there are other ones as well. And the um, if you go in the, in the US, if you go to the FAA's website, um, it'll list off these apps that you can use. All right, perfect. Um, so, yeah. So much um, and, drone knowledge. <laughs> and all the all the certification and everything that you need to do, that's all on the FAA website. And if you just do an internet search for, for that, you will you'll find what you need very easily. So perfect. Um, There's one other question, not related to the drone, but back to um, how people can access a library. I know you were saying that you can share libraries with multiple people. Somebody mm -hmm. said, um, can a whole team access a library? I teach a yearbook class. We share thousands of pictures on a server. So a whole what, what you can do is you can have any number of people access an album mm, okay. but not all photos here so uh, if, if i wanted you to be able to access all 900 of these photos i would have to put them in an album okay and grant grant you access to the album um so you could have a shared album of photos that you can all work on um and that's that's how that works in life and how would you share that? Is that like more so like you right click on the album and there's a there's an option to share or? Yes, well that you're just jumping ahead to tomorrow. <laughs> We're in a time machine, fast forward into tomorrow. So I'm not gonna talk about that in detail, but I will Got say, it. look right here in the, I'm, I'm in the album right uh, now. I'm in grid view in the album. Here's this little button up here. Should we magnify that? There it is. That is the share and invite button and you click that and you get all kinds of options and we will go over that tomorrow and it's gonna perfect. be awesome. I hope you come back. Yes, please come back tomorrow. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Those are all of our questions thus far. Okay, great. How much time do I have? Um, we have about maybe 30 it, minutes, uh, maybe okay. a little over 30 minutes. Okay, okay. That's gonna be just fine. We're gonna do perfect. great. Um, okay, so I wanna, I wanna use this um, picture as uh, another example of how I kind of try to make photos more of what they are um, and also use it um, as an opportunity to uh, showcase some a um, uh, little bit more advanced edit controls in Lightroom, including masking and also color grading. So let's do that really quickly. And when I look at this picture, what I like, uh, a lot of what I like is the subject. It's a cool ship and it's got the San Francisco skyline in the background. And I feel like I really nailed the composition on this one. Love it. Um, that ship is just kind of providing like a, a line of view directing me back to the skyline. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. But the other thing I like is the lighting, right? And this is why I went out at sunset instead of going in the middle of the day um, is to get this beautiful lighting. And I want to kind of accentuate that lighting. I have this sun sort of blasting in from the right. Um, and I, I want to make that a little bit kind of more so, right? So to do that, I'm going to use masking here. And here's the button for masking. And I will click that to go in here. And these are all of the different mask types. And we'll talk more about some of these other types. But for right now, the one I want to use is a radial gradient. So I'm going to click there. Yes, I got it. Thanks. That's telling me how to use the radial gradient. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to make a radial gradient that's coming in from where the sun is. And I'm gonna make it fairly large. And I'm just kind of dragging this out for the size and position I want. Okay. And then um, it's showing me red, that's the mask. So in other mm -hmm. words, 
these are my edit controls and whatever edits I do, they will be applied to the red area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this isn't quite where I want it yet. I want it rotated a little. So I'm gonna grab the edge of the radial gradient and I'm gonna rotate it kind of down more like that and maybe move it in a little bit. Okay, so that seems pretty good. And then I'm gonna do my edits and I'm just gonna bump up the exposure there. So that's obviously more than I want, but I just want you to see the effect this is having, right? It's lighting from out from the center of that mm -hmm. radial gradient and tapering off over the over the course of the of the gradient mm -hmm. there. Um, so something maybe, let's see, that's zero. Here's another pro tip. Double click on any slider handle and it resets it to its default. Okay, so back Perfect. at zero. Um, so I'm just gonna bump that up a little bit and I'm gonna warm it up a little bit and dehaze down up not up down yeah i don't think it needs it clarity clarity down a little bit um okay so i've got this light kind of coming in from there that's great um what i would also like is i would like this lower left corner to be mm -hmm. darkened um mm -hmm. now i could do that uh, with the brush. So I need I need another mask here, right? I want to mask mm -hmm. the lower left corner to make it darken. How do I want to do that? Well, so first I need another mask. So I'll click on the plus to create a new mask uh, for this photo. Um, I could use the brush and just kind of brush in there. I could use a linear gradient, which is like the radial gradient, but instead of being round, it's a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what I actually want to do is I want to use a radial gradient again and I'll show you how I'm going to do this to use a radial gradient to just darken down that um, dark part there, or the, sorry, that lower left um, kind of dark corner. Um, and the first thing that I need to do is I need to zoom out. Um, mm -hmm. So okay. when I have, and, and let me sh let me say what I did just now. Um, I have the, I'm not in the regular edit view, I'm in masking and I have a tool here that's gonna let me put a new radial gradient on the picture. So if I were to just click right now, it would make a new radial gradient, but that's not what I wanna do. I wanna pan and zoom. So to do that, I hold down space and now I can pan and zoom on the photo. And so I hold down space. Now I'm clicking and holding with my mouse to get my zoom cursor there. And I'm gonna zoom out like that. And the reason I'm going to zoom out is I want to make this thing really big and go outside the bounds of the photo for reasons that will be clear to you in a moment. <laughs> um, so let me click and drag and make this really big radial gradient. And then I actually want it kind of up here. Okay. So you can see now I have the opposite of what I want. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm, I have this kind of it's centered here and it starts in the upper right and it fades off towards the lower left and it's nothing down here. But what I want is a nice curve. I want it to follow this nice curve here so that I have this nice curve on the on the bottom left and I want it to be affecting this part. And mm -hmm. so I will click over here where it says invert. And now mm -hmm. I've inverted it. And now it's just affecting that part. And that's actually maybe in a little too far. So I'm gonna kind of move it out a little bit. You can I'll invert make, mass now. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so that's kind of looking more like what I want. That's pretty good. Okay, so I feel like I've got that pretty good. I'm gonna go back to fit so I can see my picture bigger. And now I'll do the edit that I want, which is just to take down the exposure a little bit. And now I'm focused just kind of on those areas away from the sun, but I'm still matching. I still have a nice round curve mm -hmm. uh, for that. And I didn't have to do it with, um, you know, manual brushing and trying to make a smooth mm -hmm. um, transition there. So, um, so that is some handy masking uh, there. Okay. Um, I said I was going to talk about color grading. I am, but actually let's move to a video because we want to talk about video editing because yes. it's a good feature in Lightroom and we're all so excited um, and I can use color grading on the video. Um, so, okay, done with that. Um, did I actually get the video that I want to use? Um, yeah, let's use this one right here. So I, uh, you'll notice this video looks fairly flat, mm -hmm. um, low contrast actually, we were messing around with it earlier, so it doesn't look all that flat. Um, now you'll notice it looks very flat. 
uh, and low contrast. That is a setting on the drone. I think it's called D log. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that just gives, I, I, the reason I do this, it doesn't look good out of the camera, as you can see. Um, and I didn't used to use this because there didn't used to be editing of videos in Lightroom. So mm -hmm. if you look at these, which I recorded earlier, um, let's find a video. This is the seals. This is not flat, right? It's punchy. It's contrasty. Mm -hmm. I haven't edited into it yet, um, but it already looks decent. Um, this is how I used to record these videos because I couldn't edit them in Lightroom and I didn't bother editing them in anything else. Yep, exactly. Um, but now I can edit in Lightroom. And so I'm recording with this um, setting on the drone because uh, it gives me much more latitude for editing after the fact. So that seal, one, the one of the seals that's already very contrasty and punchy, there's only so much I can do with that because it's mm -hmm. had a lot of edits kind of baked in already. Whereas this gives me a lot more flexibility to do edits here in Lightroom now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like why for stills you would shoot raw rather than mm -hmm. JPEG. Exactly. With the JPEGs, you know, it's already baked in all these editing, editing, and it's a it's a small color space and a small bit depth and all of that. Um, this is not raw video. There is such thing as raw video. Mm -hmm. um, the the drone doesn't. This drone doesn't produce that. Um, but it does give you some of that same um, kind of latitude for editing. So yeah. let's talk about um, kind of what we want to do here. And again, I'm not quite sure what it looks like for all of you looking at it over this video stream. Um, but for me, it's very smooth and just, it's so cool just to be able to do this even while it plays, right? It's yeah. just really, really neat. Um, so, okay, I want to improve the contrast. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take contrast up and that looks better already. Um, and I think maybe I want a little vignette on it. So I'll do a little bit of that. Um, and then I want to warm it up. You know, I was really going for kind of a warm look and those, I mean, it is very warm light here at sunset. And I was had going for a warm look in those other mm -hmm. pictures we were just looking at. And so I want to do that here too. Um, but I feel like this is just sort of, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm using the temp slider here in the white balance controls, dragging it in the, in the yellow warm direction. Um, and it's just, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And for mm -hmm. me, this is just not working. It's like, I'm just, I'm hitting it with a hammer. Right, and I, I need something that's a little bit more subtle than that, and kind of maintains the overall feel of of the um, image while still warming it up in a more pleasing way. This is not working for me. Um, so what I want to use here is color grading, mm -hmm. and what color grading is going to let me do is instead of slapping a, a you know a, a temperature adjustment over the whole image, it's going to let me target parts of the image. So mm -hmm. um, I can target the shadows, midtones, and highlights separately. And that's what each of these color wheels are. And what I want to do here is just warm up the highlights. Oh. And look at how much better that looks than that kind of global thing yeah. that I was doing affecting yep. everything. Um, so now it's really um, warming the areas that are affected by the sun, which is what makes sense mm -hmm. here. Um, and so that is really cool. So the way these work, uh, for anybody who isn't familiar with these already, um, and I can delve into as much or as little detail with color grading as anybody would mm -hmm. like, but um, uh, to pick the hue, I go around. And um, to pick saturation, I go in and out like that. Um, and this obviously is highlights that I'm working on. I could do mm -hmm. midtones and shadows separately. For shadows, maybe I want to actually go blue a little bit here. That's a little too green. There we go. I've gone blue a little bit. And uh, that might even be a little too much. I'll just back it off. Oh, that looks nice. Um, OK, I still feel like this could use a little more contrast. I'm going to bring down the shadows. And I'm also going to bring down the blacks. That's starting to look pretty nice to me right there. Mm -hmm. um, so what is that looking like here? Um, good. Oh, I'm, I'm liking it. Uh, let's see. Oh, fly. Yes, fly towards. Um, towards the, the ship. Okay, so while this goes, and there's a point to all this, bear with me, as this flies forward, you'll see in a moment, the drone gives a little kind of jostle, and then you'll see me fly away off to the right. And what happened here is right there at that little jostle, I don't know if that came through and what you're seeing, mm. is a compass interference warning popped up on the controller. Mm. Move away from sources of interference, possibly gigantic, 
aircraft carrier towers covered with antennas and radar dishes blasting stuff off and I don't know. Um, and so then I went zooming away from it. And the reason I was so concerned about that is that that's exactly what happened before the prior drone dropped into the bay. Oh, wow. So um, <laughs> this video obviously has a bunch of junk on it that I don't want, right? I love the beginning where it's, I love this part where I'm just moving in toward the, the ship. That's great. I don't need this beginning part where it's sitting there doing nothing. And I definitely don't need this end part where I'm like, ah, flee, flee. Um, so in addition to using these edit controls over here that you have for your photos, you can also trim videos in Lightroom. So as I mentioned mm -hmm. at the outset, it's not an editor, there's no timeline, but you can lop off the beginning and or end of a video so that you can focus down, trim the video down just to the important part of the video that you actually want. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you go in here to the trim controls. If we were on a photo, these would be the crop controls. Um, but here, this gives us um, trim handles down here on the timeline. Ah. And I can just drag these around. Um, what I actually like to do, um, I'm gonna put the playback head here at the beginning. I'm gonna play. And I'm going to wait for it to start moving. There we go. And I'm going to pause right there. And I'm going to press Option I. And that's the keyboard shortcut for setting the endpoint to where the playback head is. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to play ahead to that. Oh, there it is, that jostle. Let me back up just a touch. And I'm going to do Option O to set the out point to where the playback head mm -hmm. is. Um, and I just happen to like that better than dragging the handles around. I, it's just a better workflow for me. I feel like mm -hmm. I more easily hone in on where I want. Oop, I still have a little bit of that jostle. So let me frame back. Whoa, there it is. Okay. And then I'm going to, uh, so I would just click in the frame back button here to just step back a couple frames. And I'm going to option O again to set that out point to that location. Now, now, how are we looking here at the end? Perfect. Well, that's a lot of control that you have here in Lightroom then. It's really nice. Wow. Yeah. Um. So now, I've dropped that video down to 16 seconds instead of whatever 51 it was at before. And it includes just this part where I'm flying gracefully toward the tower on the ship. And I have the San Francisco skyline in the background and everything's so beautiful and lovely. Let's have a sip of water. <laughs> and it stops there. And this is ready for me to share. It looks just the way that I want. Okay. Um, really, really cool. So. I have um, lots of other things that I can talk about. Um, I want to pause just for a minute we to see have, if any questions. Yes, I was going to say we do have some questions that did pop up. Um, one question was, does Lightroom take DNG video? Um, I think this is specifically for the mobile app. Does that take... Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. That, no, no, the, I was oh, nodding no, to say no, I understand no, the question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the answer to the question, sadly, is no. So I think what the what what is being asked is about the Lightroom um, camera here. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay. so, so here's the Lightroom camera. The Lightroom camera is very cool. Here we go. Whoa. Okay, sorry. Um, the Lightroom camera is very cool and has many, many features. And one of those features is not video recording. Mm. So um, at the moment, uh, you would need to use the system camera. On, if you're using your phone, you'd have to use the system camera app uh, on your phone to record video. Perfect. And then let's see, does Lightroom have a histogram? It does have a histogram and the histogram does not yet work on video. Okay. Um, so we'll take a look here. Um, let me go in to the grid view here. Uh, sorry, the edit view. Mm -hmm. um, and here in the three dot menu, I have uh, show histogram. And that'll put the histogram up here at the top. It also has clipping indicators um, for highlights and shadows. Um, you can also click mm -hmm. to lock those to keep them on while you're editing. Um, if you want to make sure nothing's clipping. Um, so it has all of that for stills. Um, but currently histogram is not supported for video. Perfect. Got it. And then and wait, wait, actually, oh. let me let me add on to that. Um, also on the phone. So mm. uh, let me go into a picture on the phone and on the phone. And here I'm in review mode because we were doing our wonderful flagging um, earlier. Uh, let me go back to edit. Um, so I'm in edit here. And what I'm doing is I'm using two fingers to tap on the image. And that shows info in the upper left. And I'm going to do it again, two fingers to mm -hmm. tap. And that shows the histogram. Mm -hmm. 
So now I, okay. I have the histogram uh, on mobile uh, as well. Perfect. And then there is one more question. Somebody asked, can you add fades with Lightroom? Um, I'm, I'm guessing that question is about the video, a fade in and a fade mm -hmm. out at the beginning and end of the video, and you cannot. Okay. But I think that is a great idea. Yes, I agree. Perfect. Well, that is all of our questions. And we have about, I want to say like 15 minutes left in the stream, 15, 16. Okay, great. I definitely have 15 or 16 minutes worth of Yay. stuff I can talk about. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to switch back over to my phone here. And I'm going to go here. I'm in the Alameda album that we made. Um, and this is um, backwards. I actually want the... Um, just the order is backwards from what I want. I want the uh, aircraft carrier ones at the top right now. So um, it's sorted by capture date right now with, I think, uh, oldest at the top. Um, so I'm going to tap on the three dot menu in the upper right, whoop, upper right here. I'm going to tap where it says sort by capture date. Um, and I'm going to tap on just capture date again. You see that arrow that's pointing up mm -hmm. on the right. Now it points down. Great. So now I've I've re I've reversed the sort. So now I've got the aircraft carrier ones up at the top, which is what I want. Um, and so the first thing that I want to show you is video. All of that video stuff that we're do that we were doing uh, over on the computer a moment ago that is here on your telephone as well. Um, so here's the one that I edited. You can see that it's already trimmed, already edited. That work that wow. we did on the computer a moment ago has synced over here to my phone, um, and I can do that work here as well. So I'll tap on trim. There you can see the, um, you know, the trim handles for trimming it down. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tap the X to X out of that because I don't want that change I just made. Um, and you can see um, the light uh, controls here and so on. Um, so we have have these edit controls um, available as well. Okay. Um, this is an opportunity maybe for me because there was a question about this earlier. Um, for me to mention a few of the limitations of editing video uh, mm -hmm. in Lightroom. Um, and uh, you'll notice that some controls are grayed out, right? So healing and masking, both grayed out. Um, the curve, grayed out. Mm, okay. uh, and then down here at the bottom, um, there's a few, a, a couple of the controls in effects are available, including vignette, which we used on this video, and also grain. Um, texture clarity, dehaze are grayed out, and then all of detail, optics, and geometry. So mm. there are some things that don't work on videos, um, but all the essential light and color controls, including color mixing and color grading, um, work on videos. I need to give us, in the interest of full disclosure, a slight caveat to that, which is that on iOS at the moment, color grading and color mix are not implemented yet. Coming yeah. soon. They work. It Perfect. works on Mac and Windows and Android. Um, it didn't quite make it on iOS. It'll it'll be there soon. Okay, perfect. Um, and even though, sorry, let me add. Even though you can't, um, even though you can't control those edits from iOS, those color grading edits that we did on desktop, they show correctly here. Mm, on iOS. Okay, okay, so. that's actually a good point there. And then I know I have a question, but there is another question about. Um, what you can, you know, you mentioned that you can't do the, like the fade in, the fade out. You mm -hmm. also can't rearrange videos, obviously in Lightroom. That's something you would do more so in Premiere. Could you export from Lightroom into Premiere with video by any chance? Yeah. So right now, what you can do is you can go up here to the share button in Lightroom mm -hmm. and you can choose export. Um, and for this, I would export as a full size edited video. Mm -hmm. um, so I can export the original out and but that's just a bit for bit copy of the original file and it doesn't include any of my edits mm -hmm. um so i would probably want to export an mp4 which is a rendered video it includes all of my edits and bring that in to premiere or rush okay. or whatever i was working with now okay. the um the editing in lightroom and the editing in premiere are are different right mm -hmm. premiere doesn't use these you know, ACR controls that we use for photos in, in mm -hmm. Lightroom. And so we sort of had a choice, right? We're like, well, do we want, because right, you heard me talking about it's a rendered file, right? So the mm -hmm. edits are not coming in non-destructively to, to Premiere. It's these edits are baked into the file that we render mm -hmm. out of Lightroom. Um, that's great when you're sharing to Instagram or whatever. It's maybe not necessarily what you'd want going to Premiere. Um, mm -hmm. 
anybody who works in Lightroom is accustomed to non-destructive editing. Uh, people who are, work a lot with video are very accustomed to non-destructive editing because that's the way video has been forever. Um, so ideally in that scenario, you might want those edits to come into Premiere non-destructively so that you could tweak them in Premiere after the fact. Mm. We kind of had a choice here in Lightroom and our choice was, look, the technology for editing photos in Lightroom and the technology for editing videos in Premiere are completely different. Mm -hmm. Do we want people in Lightroom to be able to edit their videos the same way they edit their photos? Or do we want to be able to transfer edits non-destructively into Premiere? We really had to kind of make that choice mm -hmm. and decided, you know what, it's more important to have this seamless editing experience within Lightroom between photos and videos. I agree with uh, that for sure. And I think that, I mean, that keeps the point of Premiere. If I wanted to utilize Premiere, um, you know, on its own, I could, but sometimes if I need something quick, um, I think it's better to keep the same kind of look between photos and videos in Lightroom. So I like that you all made that choice. Absolutely. And then there uh, was we're, one, we're, yeah. one more personal question that I had. Yes. Um, I know that there are some updates to um, Lightroom when it comes to presets. And I know we'll probably talk about that tomorrow, but is there an also option as you're editing, can you add presets to a video? Let's say you were adding presets to other photos and you want the same kind of look for your video. Could you add that preset to a video? And then I know there's things that you could do with presets now that I won't mention, but I know you can do that. We'll probably yeah. touch that a little bit tomorrow as well. Yes, that's all. I'm I'm so glad that I planned the right things for tomorrow. <laughs> um, that's all stuff that I'm planning to hit tomorrow. Um, and if you're not able to make it tomorrow, these are always recorded and you can always watch them after the fact. Um, so absolutely, yes, you can use presets on videos. You could create your own presets. You can use the same presets across mm -hmm. photos and videos. And I'm going to be showing all of that tomorrow. It's very, very cool, exciting stuff. Um, and so I'll be talking about all of that as, as kind of a part of a deep dive into batch editing here in Lightroom. Awesome. Perfect. But I'll, I'll save that for tomorrow. Awesome. And we have about like maybe nine, 10 minutes left. So if you all have any questions that are remaining, of course, we'll be back tomorrow, but please make sure you drop them in the chat, whether you are on Behance or YouTube. Um, and then Ben, do you think there's any, maybe one or two other tips that you might have that you want to show us before we begin to sign off sadly? Yes. Yes, there absolutely are. Um, and I, let me do that. This is a great time for that because I have a couple things that I want to show. Um, that are not about this project. Um, so uh, overall for, for today and tomorrow, I kind of want to make it about this project that we're creating mm. here together. Um, but there's some cool new things in Lightroom that have nothing to do with <laughs> my project um, that I want to be sure that people know about. So let me just show um, that right now. Um, and let me switch to a different album that I have here. And uh, the first new feature edition in Lightroom that I want to mention uh, is red eye removal. So this of course has been in Lightroom Classic forever. Mm -hmm. um, it is one of our most requested features for Lightroom, <laughs> very highly requested feature, um, maybe in particular by people who have come from Classic and were accustomed to having it there. Um, Honestly, I don't know. I mean, you all know what red eye is and how it happens. If you're using mm -hmm. an on-camera flash, a lot of the time people's eyes will glow red because they're reflecting the flash. Um, uh, I don't know how often we really get this in our photos these days. Um, <laughs> maybe it's more for older uh, photos. I have to say this is not even my photo um, because I, I didn't have a red eye photo um, to, to use and obviously was definitely not capturing any uh, photos with my drone that had red eye in them. Um, but I was able to borrow this photo from our test files um, just to show you the feature. So as I mentioned, of course, Lightroom Classic has had the red eye removal forever. Um, we didn't want to just bring over what was in Classic to Lightroom mm -hmm. because it was implemented in Lightroom Classic, you know, 10 or 15 years ago or whenever that was. And we have new technology now. Mm -hmm. um, can we make it a little bit better? Um, and so we have we now um, offer uh, an automatic red eye removal. So let's take a look at that really quickly. Um, you can find red eye removal here in the heel controls. So we were in here a moment ago when we were removing the welcome aboard sign, which we didn't want for our end of the world mm -hmm. picture. Um, so of course it defaults to the healing brush, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but we now also have this red eye tab here in the healing panel. So mm -hmm. I will go ahead and click on that. 
And you'll see the same manual controls um, that you have in Lightroom Classic are available here as well. But in addition, we now have this button that says autocorrect. And so all you really need to do instead of manually circling each eye um, is just click on autocorrect and Lightroom will use artificial intelligence to find the eyes in the photo and correct mm. them. Um, so that is a great one. Uh, I, I'm, wow. uh, yeah. I, I don't know how often I'm going to use that, but when you need it, you need it, <laughs> You right? need it and it's there. <laughs> you need it and you need it. So now it's there. Um, so there, there you go. That is red eye removal. Um, you mentioned uh, presets, some questions about presets. You mentioned mm -hmm. that we have some preset improvements um, in, uh, in this release. We do. We have a lot of exciting stuff related to presets in this release. We're going to dive into it more tomorrow, mm -hmm. but... How much time do I have? I have five, six, six minutes. I would say five, five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. I think I, that is enough. Um, let's take, I just want to use uh, another photo and, and we'll look at this more tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to give just a sneak preview of this here. Um, we have a new class of presets available here in Lightroom uh, in this release, which came out this past Monday um, that we're calling adaptive presets. And unlike all of the previously existing presets that affect the you know whole image indiscriminately, or I should say sort of affect each image um, identically, this looks at your photo and affects just parts of the photo. Um, and so what it does is it leverages the select subject and select sky masking technology. Mm -hmm. So these are AI powered masks that we introduced in Lightroom last fall. Wow. And you click on one of these, mm -hmm. like I'll click on, um, select subject and it looks at my photo and it finds the subject and selects the subject for me. I mean, how long would it have taken me to manually select yeah. the subject here, right? Forever. And now I can, you know, do whatever I want, um, of sort of editing to that subject. Um, and then we also have this, um, select sky and likewise, um, it will automatically select the sky for me. Now in this photo, that's actually pretty easy. I could have done that with a linear gradient in this photo, but in some photos, you know, you have a skyline mm -hmm. with buildings coming up and down and things like that. And the sky would be a complex selection. This automatically selects the sky. Um, I'm going to talk more in detail about these tomorrow. Um, uh, and these aren't new, right? This masking mm -hmm. came out last fall. So we've, we've had that um, for a while, but I am going to delete whole masks. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of lay that groundwork for this new preset feature which are these adaptive presets. So we have adaptive sky and adaptive subject. And what they're doing is they are leveraging those artificial intelligence masks that I just showed. So you don't need necessarily to, you know, know how to use this stuff or to take the time to go and mess around with manual masking controls. Now you can use these, uh, you can leverage the power of those AI masks just via presets with a single click. So let's take a look at how this works. In just a second here, well here, let me use something that's um, not uh, an adaptive preset. So here I've just opened up some of our other premium presets. And what I'm doing here is I'm just rolling the cursor over mm -hmm. the preset names and it's previewing the preset on my photo, right? Okay, so I'm gonna do that here for the adaptive ones in just a moment. Um, but the reason I'm, I haven't done it yet is I want you to look what happens when I do it. When I roll, I'm gonna roll the cursor over the first preset name. And when I do, you're going to see a little blue progress bar appear to the right of the preset name um, just for a moment. And that's it finding the sky, mm -hmm. right? So it, it takes the AI a second to find the sky and then it applies edits just to the sky. So I'll roll over. Nope, it's not going to take it a second because it already found the sky because I was messing around with masking on this photo. <laughs> Let's use a different one. So here's one I haven't done yet. I roll over. There, you see that little blue progress bar there for a second? Mm -hmm. That was it looking for and finding the sky, ah. all right? Um, but once it's found it, it's found it for this photo now. So it doesn't need to do it again for the mm -hmm. other ones, right? Um, okay, let's go back to this picture because it demonstrates the presets a little better. So there we go. I moved off of the photo and it forgot about it. Um, so they had to do it again, found the sky. Um, so these are just some different um, options. Uh, that we have built in via presets now for just making your sky look awesome Wow! with a click on a preset. And you don't have to worry about messing around manually with masking at all. Likewise, we have the same ones here for the subject. So you'll notice I rolled over, it did that really quickly found the subject. And now mm -hmm. I'm, you know, previewing these edits uh, of my, on, on my subject here. So 
this looks great. I think I like Sunrise. Um, I'll click that one. And I think I liked the glow um, on, on my subject here. So I'll click that. But I think it's a little bit too much. I think the subject is, a little, I like what it's doing, but I think it's a little too glowy. Well, that gives me an opportunity in one minute um, to tell you about um, another new feature in this release of Lightroom, which is the preset amount slider. Mm -hmm. So now when you apply a preset, you can change the intensity of that preset with the slider. And this works with any of the presets, not just the adaptive mm -hmm. ones that I'm showing here. So I can just back that off a little bit, like all the way, or I can increase it if I want to bump it up a little bit. Um, and I, so this lets me really kind of customize a preset without needing to tweak any of the sliders, you know, the, the manual edit sliders, yeah. I can just kind of dial a preset in kind of right to where I want it. Um, how have I done? Have I hit right on the, am I out you, of time? You hit it right <laughs> on the nail, right? All at, right. Right at our closing mark. Um, ben, thank you so much for going through all of that. It was really incredible to see all of the different new features in action. I know there is so many questions that we went over today. If any questions come up, I know you had offered your email earlier. Yep. And so that can be dropped in the chat box again. Um, we will be back tomorrow. So we're going to be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Pacific for part two of photo editing editing with Ben. So you want to make sure that you stick around also for the Lightroom Bootcamp with Aaron Nace immediately following the stream. So if you all missed any aspects of the stream as well, I do want to mention that you can go over to Behance to watch the replay. You can go over to YouTube as well to watch the replay. We have a lot of exciting things. I think I saw one or two questions about um, I know I saw one about presets again. And so we'll probably go into more detail about that tomorrow. Uh, which absolutely. Be exciting. Yep. Perfect, perfect. And then lastly, following the creative challenge, you want to make sure that you join Lisa Carney for another photo editing live stream. Um, Lisa will show you how to edit a variety of photos and export them for social media across all platforms. So I'm really excited for to, to learn a little bit more about that. And Ben, thank you so much for your time. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Bye.